Hello, everybody. Welcome to MD Insights. I'm Dr. Matthew Walsh from the Cleveland Clinic, and it's a real pleasure to have Dr. David Karpata with us today. How did you uh, wander through life and end up at the Cleveland Clinic? Uh, well, you know, it starts uh, in New York. <laughs> That's where I actually grew up and then went to Arizona, but ultimately ended up in Cleveland because um, during my training at medical school, which was at the University of Arizona, I wanted to become a surgeon. And I did my surgical training at University Hospitals in Cleveland, our neighbor over here. Um, but actually went on to do my fellowship here at the Cleveland Clinic. And I've actually been here ever since. And, uh, and the real reason is that my wife is originally from Cleveland, which is probably why most people end up in Cleveland. Other than the Browns. So, <laughs> um, so your area of interest in surgery is um, hernia type surgery, I would say. You're, you have a section called abdominal core health. What's, what is that about? about? Yeah, so, you know, over the last probably 15 years or so, there's been a, a renewed interest uh, in hernia surgery as being more than just fixing a hole. Uh, and we look at hernia surgery as something that really takes care of the entire abdominal wall uh, and how it relates to not only the pelvis, but the diaphragm and, and the interactions between all of those. So we consider that all of the abdominal core health. But specifically, um, you know, I tend to manage more complex uh, hernia cases and, and with a specific interest in chronic groin pain after inguinal hernia surgery. Okay, so as you say, a lot of uh, surgeons do hernia surgery. I thought today we would talk about inguinal hernia repair and a problem that can happen from that, which is chronic groin pain. So not something you want to have as an outcome. Um, as in other things in surgery, to avoid problems in long-term outcomes, how can you avoid the problem of pain after an inguinal hernia repair? So how does pain come about, do you think, in general, and then therefore how can it be avoided? Yeah, I think there's a couple points to be taken away from this question. I think most importantly is that number one, having a thorough understanding of the inguinal anatomy, especially the nerves and the trajectory in which they course through the abdominal wall is important to try and prevent uh, uh, long-term complications like chronic groin pain. Uh, the other thing that we know is that there are risk factors of people who have chronic pain to begin with or people who have uh, complications uh, after an inguinal hernia repair, like hematomas, are at higher risk for developing chronic groin pain. But importantly, you know, even if you know the anatomy very well, you're still, you can still put a patient at risk for chronic groin pain just because of the nature of the operation. Uh, it is in close proximity to nerves and there's always gonna be an interaction between the mesh itself uh, as well as the nerves. And so while we try to minimize it, uh, it's important to recognize that it can happen to anybody, any surgeon can cause it, and, and that you just understand what a patient might be going through and kind of direct them uh, appropriately if they do come to you after surgery with that. So if you're a patient or a surgeon and you have a lot of pain before surgery for an inguinal hernia, should you be wary about either having the surgery done or doing the surgery? or? or not necessarily? Are there any red flags that might predict, based on that preoperative symptoms, what happens long-term for these patients? Yeah, I think one of the most common things that we see uh, is a patient who has atypical hernia symptoms and, and with pain being their most significant or prominent symptom. And what I mean with that is, most people will present with a bulge uh, in the groin that's consistent with a hernia. But when somebody presents with a with a groin pain without evidence of an inguinal bulge, I think that should uh, put up some signals right there for the surgeon to investigate further. And it's not a patient I would operate on without at least having some imaging to suggest a hernia or ruling out other primary causes of groin pain like hip related pains or back related pains. Okay. And there are common ways to do hernia repairs now, uh, sort of the open approach in the groin versus laparoscopic through the abdomen, do they affect the likelihood that you might have groin pain? And is that a reason to do one type of surgery over another? 
Yeah, I think the, the literature would suggest that laparoscopic repairs may have lower uh, rates of chronic groin pain. Uh, a lot of this data is from larger series put into meta-analyses, and it doesn't really parse out the main components of open repairs. And I think there are certain components to open repairs that may put people at higher risk. For instance, using like a plug uh, or a balled up piece of mesh uh, as opposed to a flat sheet. Uh, and, and I think equally as much if somebody is not facile at laparoscopic, but they're trying to do it that way, they, they may be at more risk of putting somebody in chronic groin pain if they do a really good open repair, but they elect to do a less than effective uh, laparoscopic repair. So you talked about the use of mesh, which is uh, typically a plastic screen that's used in repairing hernias now. What is it about mesh that can cause pain? Yeah, so I think, you know, number one is that the, you have to recognize that mesh is a foreign material. Uh, and so it is, the, it is the presence of a foreign material in your body. And there's going to be scarring around that. And so people can have it from the scarring itself causing some constriction. Uh, it could be from its interaction with the nerves and scarring on the nerves are causing impingement. Um, or it can be the, the mesh itself, as I mentioned, is certain types, the way they're placed uh, or the way they're configured. If they're more bulky in nature, they may put people at increased risk. And you mentioned a plug. What, what is that exactly? And do you use that for a standard repair? Should it be used or not in terms of this outcome? Yeah, so this is, I do not use plugs. Uh, just to describe a plug, I think the best description, if you think of badminton, it's like the shuttlecock. Uh, and essentially, it's uh, conical in shape. Uh, take a piece of mesh that uh, is originally flat and put it into a cone formation, and it fits in the hernia. So a hernia as a whole, a lot of things go through it that shouldn't. And so the idea is that you're going to block anything from going through that hole. It's like plugging up a dam. And so I think theoretically, it has some, some good concepts that it is going to prevent a hernia, but it also puts a very bulky piece of material in a fixed position that where you where your body bends so i think people do tend to feel that more often um, just to be honest if i had my way i would probably uh, not uh, have people get plugs is plug use tr uh, in the data known to have a higher chronic groin pain rate there are studies that some studies that would suggest that plugs can cause higher rates of pain so what do you think the likelihood if you get a open repair, let's say, that you would have chronic pain? Yeah, so there's a really interesting study that came out of uh, Sweden that I always like to quote with this question. They actually asked people one year after their hernia repair what their level of pain was within the last week. And 10, uh, or sorry, 15 percent of people said that they had pain within the last week that impacted their ability to concentrate. So that may not impact their ability to go about their life, but about 10 to 15% will feel some discomfort. In terms of people that are actually seeking medical attention or requiring intervention, it's about one to 3%. Okay, and I know you have created a program uh, that's multidisciplinary, and what, what is the, in people with chronic pain after surgery, what's the goal of that program, would you say? Yeah, so probably one of the most important things with pain is to recognize that it's multifactorial uh, and that surgery itself isn't always the solution and that it does take a thorough uh, evaluation and, and medical as well as sometimes surgical treatments. And so the goal is when a patient comes in to the chronic groin pain clinic, they will see a surgeon, they will see uh, a pain psychologist, and they will also get uh, imaging evaluation. And the goal is that by the end of that visit, they'll have a comprehensive plan that they can move forward with, whether it's medical or surgical, based on recommendations from the group. So, so it's sort of a one-stop shop, make it easy for individuals with a complex situation to try and get uh, all the care that they need. Okay. And the goal of the imaging, I assume, is to look for potential, aha, that's the cause type of pain? Yeah, it's equally as it is to find the causes. It's also used to rule out other causes. So uh, there's many, many things that can cause uh, pain, as we discussed, whether or not it's the mesh or the nerves themselves that may be injured. And we can actually look at the nerves with, uh, with ultrasound imaging 
We can also look at the core, what people would consider a core injury, and see how the muscles insert onto the pelvis and see if that may actually be the cause of their pain. So I can imagine people not necessarily wanting to have surgery again if surgery was the cause of the pain, and uh, which can happen. Who do you think will benefit from surgery? And, and then we'll talk typically what surgery would you do for people? Yeah, I think when I consider about the people who are probably best suited for surgery, it's obviously number one that you would find some something on imaging that you feel is, is reversible, whether or not it's a direct nerve injury or you see abnormalities with the mesh itself. Uh, but also in terms of the chronology of people's symptoms after their operation. So I always consider that if the operation is what caused it, we want to try and undo what was done. And so if somebody comes in and they say, I had pain immediately after surgery that never went away. That is the most ideal candidate for somebody who's probably going to benefit from either mesh removal or neurectomies. So does, do pain blocks predict who's going to benefit from reoperation or not? So that is a great question. Uh, and we actually don't have the answer to that. Uh, but we are initiating a randomized control trial to investigate that specific question. So. Hopefully, we'll be able to do another MD Insights in the future and have uh, an answer to that question. You get one shot, Dr. Kapata. This is it. Well, I guess we don't have an answer then. <laughs> so is, is it the mesh itself or is it how often is the fixation of the mesh, whether by tacks or sutures, the cause of the pain? And does that, has that all impacted how you yourself implant the mesh or do surgery, whether it's laparoscopic or open? Yeah, uh, you know, it's hard to say exact numbers in terms of uh, what percentage are related to the fixation or the mesh or a combination of the two. I would say that if you, that it's probably the, it's in the lower percentage of, uh, of that are actually caused by the fixation itself. But historically, there are some hallmarks to identifying those individuals where it is from tech or fixation. Uh, and that's typically somebody who comes out of surgery and has immediate pain that's neuropathic in nature, meaning it's sharp burning, radiating ele electric shocks down their uh, dermatomal path. Uh, and those are people who, who should have more immediate intervention when you do find that. Okay. And I, I'm sure, unfortunately, there are patients who seek out your uh, multidisciplinary clinic. Relatively speaking of the patients you see, how many end up going to surgery? It's probably about 75% of patients end up uh, receiving a, a surgical intervention. Um, we do tend to be more aggressive in terms of our treatment for that because by the time people have reached uh, a clinic like ours, they're, they're pretty desperate. Uh, they're, uh, at points where it's really impacted their quality of life and can even get to a point where they're uh, suicidal. Uh, so we do tend to be fairly aggressive with our approach. So what, what is the typical surgery that will happen? So the most common uh, operation that we perform is mesh removal with neurectomy. Uh, and that is the idea behind that is that there's you know, two pathways that people can experience pain, whether or not it's from the mesh itself or from nerve-related injury or scarring around the nerve. And so to give somebody their best chance at full relief, uh, we try to uh, take out the mesh as well as cut the nerves. Uh, if somebody is isolated to a single nerve, or we can determine that based off of dermatomal mapping uh, in the exam room, then sometimes we will do less interventions and just try cutting nerves. Or if somebody, has, uh, somebody desires not to have their nerves cut, we can just remove mesh too. And is the operation the same if it was the initial operation was laparoscopic versus open? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately they're not. They do have two different sort of risk profiles associated with them. Um, you know, the, the open intervention, you know, somebody's had open mesh, it's typically an open mesh removal. So going through the same incision uh, and getting everything out through the front again. But for laparoscopy, it's usually again done laparoscopic where we remove it through the small incisions uh, but that, as I mentioned, does have a higher risk profile just because of the way the mesh is placed. It's in close proximity to the major vessels that run down the leg. Uh, so it is, a, it is something to take into consideration when having that surgery. And if people are going to benefit from the surgery, do they benefit immediately? Or does it take time for the pain to go away? What, what has been your experience? 
Yeah, as most people will notice uh, a rather immediate difference in their pain, not resolution of their pain immediately, but they will say that they feel like the pain is different. And they'll notice that in the first couple of days. Uh, and then once they get over their surgical pain in about four to six weeks, that's when they're really experiencing their improvement. And, you know, pain is always a difficult thing to be operating on. Have you found this to be a gratifying field? Uh, it is equally as much challenging and gratifying. Uh, I think probably the, the most enjoyable outcomes that I've had in surgery have been the people who you've been able to restore their quality of life by eliminating their pain. Um, you can see it not only in the patient, but in their partners, in their life partners, um, that it really impacts their entire social life uh, and their, their job life. Some people lose their jobs are finally able to get back to work after that. So I, I find it incredibly rewarding, uh, but it's also equally challenging because sometimes we can't help. Uh, and that's an unfortunate reality of operating on pain is that you, you can't help everybody. Uh, and that's always a struggle to manage uh, when it doesn't impact people. Well, it's great that you like to operate on pain. We should get you involved in chronic pancreatitis. That can be your next. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that up to you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kirpata. You have very interesting uh, work that you're involved in and we appreciate that you uh, had such an interest and thanks everyone for joining us on MD Insights.